Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this partner session. Uh, I just wanted to apologize quickly for our slight delay. Um, you know, we had a few technical hiccups, and I think we were all up kind of late last night uh, watching uh, the results pour in. But uh, we're here, and we're ready to get started. So uh, thank you for joining us. So I'm really excited about our webinar today. Uh, and as you know, if you've attended some of the ones that we've done in the past, uh, you'll know that this one's going to be a little different uh, from our usual format, uh, where today we're going to be doing a fireside chat uh, with Jeffrey Zeldman. Now, I just want to make sure that everyone who is on the attendee side right now can hear me uh, and can also see my screen. So if you could just um, confirm that in the questions panel, that you can both hear the audio and see the screen okay. Great. So it looks like it's uh, all good. Um, so we'll continue, and, uh, and then once we get forward, I'll, I'll get a test again. So I'm Simon Heaton. Uh, I work here at Shopify as a content strategist. And as I said, I'm super excited to have uh, Jeffrey here with us today. I'm going to be kind of moderating the webinar today, uh, and we'll be recording this as well. So uh, for anyone who has to jump off or if your connection drops or anything, don't worry. We'll be sharing uh, the whole conversation with everybody in about a few days uh, up to a week. Now, uh, hosting our fireside chat today with Jeffrey is Keir Whitaker, who is a partner growth manager uh, and design advocate here at Shopify. Uh, many of you, if you've kind of been in the partner ecosystem or you've interacted with us at events before, you've probably spoken to Keir, met him, maybe uh, read some of his blog posts around uh, Shopify tutorials and Liquid. Uh, and so he'll be here kind of hosting on the side uh, of the conversation. Um, so. Kier, you can feel free to say hello. I just want to make sure everyone can hear you. Hey, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, can everyone hear Kier all right? If you could confirm in the <laughs> questions tab. I'm sure, yes, we're all good. Welcome. Perfect. That's great to hear. <clears throat> uh, now on to our guest today. Uh, we have Jeffrey Zeldman, who is uh, the founder of Studio Zeldman, as well as the author of Designing with Web Standards. Uh, he's also the man behind the popular web publication, uh, a list apart, and he's the co-founder of a book apart and event apart, and we're super thrilled to have you here. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Thanks a lot, Simon. No problem. And so, can everyone hear Jeffrey as well? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Okay, great. That's perfect. So all our audio is working. I'm super happy about that. Um, so this is going to be a very interactive format. We got a few questions. We'll start going through with Jeffrey. Uh, but if you have anything you'd like to ask him yourself, please drop them in the questions panel, uh, and we'll we'll start digging into those as well throughout the presentation. Is um, there a uh, is there a Shopify tweet I can retweet? Uh, yeah, that definitely. Says that we're live now. That says that we're live now. Uh, I, I believe we might. Yeah, we'll be tweeting out of the at Shopify Partners handle, uh, and there'll be something there shortly saying we're live. So feel free to retweet it as much I as you will. like. <laughs> I will do that because uh, that's part of my process. That's part of, uh, you know, uh, social media, even before social media, like connecting with people is a big part of this whole studio business to me. This is great. But uh, so, Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you. I know we've got uh, a few questions coming in the chat, but please, I do encourage you. This is a fantastic opportunity to literally ask uh, Jeffrey uh, anything. Uh, we've got a couple coming in. Um, I have uh, a bunch of my own as well, so why don't we start with one of mine, just uh, as host's privilege. And you talked about there at the beginning um, about how sharing and connecting with people is something that you, um, you take sort of pride in, have done, done for a long time through your blog, through your tweets, and through your publications and things like that. How do people in this web, the web industry today, how do they build reputation and get noticed? What are the things that you would advise maybe some of the students you work with at SVA to kind of get out there and you know, make a name for themselves. Yeah, so thank you. I, I love that question. I Making a name for yourself, it, it definitely gets harder and harder with each year. I mean, in some ways, I was very lucky. I started doing web design in 1995, and I liked sharing. In 1995, there were like, I don't know, a hundred of us, a thousand of us, some, I don't know how many there were, but there weren't that many. Maybe there were 10 or 20,000, but still it was it was a little easier to break out of the box. Um, the other thing, I never did it with the point of view of getting known or getting business or anything. I did it to do it. I uh, 
my background. My background is uh, I had a substance problem, and I was uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'd been sober for about two years. And one of the things they teach you there is, you know, get busy, share, help other people, because uh, when you're sitting there in the corner feeling sorry for yourself because of your divorce or your money situation or your friends don't like you or whatever, whatever self-pitying thing drives you to, you know, use stuff. Uh, substances instead of that help somebody else who needs more help than you so I I had gotten in the habit of that and I'd been sober for a few years and I was so excited when I started designing websites I was so turned on by the power to communicate worldwide and the fact that it was learnable and that it you know I mean everything else to get published you had to get through a cadre of editors and to make a film, you had to sell, you know, you had to have meeting after meeting with rich people and, you know, all along the way, almost anything you want to do, there's like a huge chance of failure. But the web, literally anybody could, I mean, if, if you could afford a connection, in fact, if you couldn't afford a connection, you could, you could set up a website from the public library, right? Mm. So I was so turned on by that that I did the same thing I was doing in my personal life in AA, which was just share, just share. And so I'd done a commercial site, and then I did a personal site, and at first I tried to make it entertaining, but very soon I was just writing, well, we didn't call them blog posts then, but I was just blogging about, like, here's how this stuff works. You know, basically creating content, but not thinking of it as content so much, just sharing and teaching. And I think today, for anyone who wants to start, I think the most important thing is, if you think about it as, okay, I'm going to conquer this space and get famous or whatever, that's probably not going to work for you. But if you just go, my point of view is worth sharing. I have a voice and I matter. And my thoughts matter. That's the truth. And that's all that matters. And uh, I teach, at, as you said, in the School of Visual Arts uh, MFA program in interaction design. And, uh, you know, and those are really really smart and gifted people, the students there. Um, and I think they know, most of them know, you know, it's really important to get out there. I, I believe that most of us who are drawn to this kind of work, well, I was the kind of kid that stayed in my room, like while other kids were out playing, I stayed in my room drawing comics. So if you're the kind of person, and my daughter's the same way, she really prefers to be alone and doing something creative. And I think a lot of people in our industry, developers, designers, content strategists, UX people, a lot of us, they may have a social side, but there's also a very private side that just likes to sort of, I mean, I like, you know, just give me some good equipment and leave me alone. Give me a <laughs> pair of headphones and leave me alone is pretty much, I could call that a good day, right? So it's important for a lot of reasons, spiritual reasons too, to break out of that a little bit. It's important if you really just like to go in, into yourself and not connect with other people. It's really important to connect also to be a, a fully rounded human being. And I, I find that I didn't really understand design until I wrote about it. I mean, I'd read a lot about design and I would practiced a lot of design, but until I started talking about it, I didn't realize what I already knew and what I thought. And the things that I thought that didn't really make sense, that didn't really hold up, you know. It, mm. I mean, do you ever have a conversation with someone and uh, you realize as you're talking that you don't know what the heck you're talking about, right? You're you're sort of halfway into it and you're like, what? It could be science, you know, or you're talking about, you know, an illness or whatever it is could be politics, whatever it is, you realize I really should read more. And I think I think there's that. I think the practice of writing helps you realize what you don't know. And so you start finding other people to follow. And, uh, you know, I, I always say blog like no one's reading. Don't worry about it. And don't, don't judge yourself. And don't listen to the little doubting voice that tells you what you have to say is unimportant. Just uh, blogging is a great thing if you're not a writer. Either you can contribute to a group blog in some other way. Um, one of my favorites is Fonts in Use. You know fontsinuse.com? Of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, Stoof and uh, Nick Sherman. And I'm forgetting the... Th There's a few collaborators. They're type designers. They're really brilliant. And they just... They, 
they they see type the way you and I would recognize a letter, right? I mean, they can recognize like every typeface ever made out there. Like, I don't mean, I don't mean saying, oh, it's Helvetica Noia. I mean, like seeing cookie dough, uh, you know, or Harry Obese Squeezed or whatever, just some bizarre font we haven't even heard of and recognize, oh, yes, that's the 1935 kind of it or whatever. And so they'll, they'll find uh, objects out there, album covers, whatever, and they post them along with the typeface and then link to where you can get that typeface. And it's, it's a remarkable different way of thinking about design. And they don't necessarily, I mean, actually, they also blog because, but even if you don't, the point is you can have an impact. Um, sure. You can have an impact uh, by, or you can have an impact on code pen. You can have an impact by, you know, sharing code and just like a quick summary of it. Whatever, whatever works best for you, but get your stuff out there. It's really important. It's really Absolutely. important. It, I think uh, it leads I, I was to, at, yeah. No, I was going to say, I was looking at your blog today, and um, I had in my head you've, you've been blogging for 20 years, but I think the archives on the current side only go back, only go back as far as 2005. Um, sure, because but, I, but I, was, I was hand coding it until then. Wow. But, and um, I just, uh, I, WordPress existed, but I was just resisting it. I thought, <laughs> no, I, you know, I know how I want to code this thing, and I don't know. You're, um, a lot of people say in this day and age that you know when you blog, maybe if, if you're in an industry, you should you should stay on topic. And I notice uh, you've never really done that. You 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 you've some very deeply personal posts. There's a lot of design posts. There's a lot of roundups from AEA. Any any thoughts on that? Do, do you th you're very open. Is that something that you've always sought to be? I learned that from friends. No, I wasn't open at all. I uh, I originally I wrote articles for a list apart, and uh, I had a thing called Ask Dr. Webb on my site for a while about HTML yeah. and design, right, HTML and design. And I wrote, well, I guess, like, kind of like Daring Fireball is now, short and long pieces every day on Seldman.com, which is why I called it the Daily Report. It really was a daily thing. Um, yep. Kind of like you might do on Twitter now. In fact, like I do on Twitter now, right, 10 times a day, only then it was 10 times a day on my own site. And I wasn't sharing anything personal because I thought, who cares about that? I had uh, several friends, uh, I don't know, Todd Dominey, I remember. Uh, Dominey Design, you may know. Um, brilliant, brilliant. He's a Twitter now. but He's a guy from Atlanta, Georgia, brilliant designer. Um, we worked on some stuff together. Some, uh, he's a really interesting guy, but he had this great blog called whatdoiknow.org back in the day. And at one point, he put out what he was listening to. Just mm -hmm. like in the sidebar, it said, like, listening to, I don't know, what I, it wasn't Fall Out Boy. It was a band that sounds, the name is similar to that. And I thought, who gives a damn what you're listening to? Like, that, I like him, and I didn't mean to be offensive, but in my head it was like, nobody cares what, you know, why would anyone care about that? Uh, and then uh, my friend Derek Puazic, who at the time had a site called Frey.com, which was a personal storytelling site. And I looked at that and I was kind of amazed by it. Like, and again, this is like a long time ago. Uh, I was like, wow, these people are telling their own stories and that it's interesting. And Derek used to art direct or have guest art directors art direct the stories using often very interesting presentational HTML that nobody had thought of yet. One of my favorites being there was a story about someone's first experience in like an amateur play and you had to use frames and drag the frames to see the story. And the frames were like curtains that kept uh, opening to reveal the next scene, right? So you'd, you'd read column here, read the column there, then drag the two frames apart. So you could, and I thought well, that was so wonderful. And then he fell in love with someone and, and wrote about it. And I was like, okay, the next thing I knew I was doing that too. I segregated it at first and called it my glamorous life, and it was like a different stream on my site architecturally. I remember that, yeah. And the, the first one I wrote about was just this weird, simple interaction where I went to the corner, I tried to use an ATM machine, it ate my card, it, it, uh, it told me that it had given me the money, but it hadn't. So it basically deducted $200 from my account without giving me cash and held onto my card. And I was really frustrated. And then there was a woman behind me in line. I said, I, I, I called the bank to tell them what had happened. And I, I said, I wouldn't use that machine. I think it's, she said, oh, wouldn't you? I live in New York. She said, oh, wouldn't you? And I said, 
um, no, I think it's broken. It just ate my card and didn't give me any money. And she put her card in anyway. And then it worked for her. And she took it out and took out her money and her card and looked at me and went, worked for me. <laughs> like I was some scumbag. Like I was some morally reprehensible. Not like I was a person who just got ripped off by a bank machine trying to help her not lose her money, not lose her card. But like I was some scumbag bumming her out with my negativity. And she just wanted to let me know that even if God had seen fit to punish me by not giving me money because I'm a bad person, she was able to get money from the machine because she was on the right side of morality or whatever. Whatever was going on in her head. And it was really short, and I wrote it really short, but it was just like this little... And uh, I don't know why I wrote it, but it made me angry. And I find that often, like, anger is a pretty good motivation to write. Mm. You know, it's also good motivation to do things you might regret. But but writing seems like a thing you don't necessarily have to regret, depending on what you say when you write and who you say it to. Anyway, um, I wrote that and got a really good response to it. And about a couple of weeks later, I did it again. And then, you know, September 11th happened and I was already in the habit of doing it. So there were three days where we couldn't, I didn't have access and I kept blogging anyway, literally on waiting until I had a connection again so I could post that stuff. Uh, like the third day after September 11th, I posted three days in a row of just from the ground and not from ground zero, just from the surreal being in the city where this had just happened and it was in the air, but you could still go to the grocery store. And there were tanks on the street, but it was still a normal day. Like, And you couldn't go below 14th Street, but on 15th Street, people were joking and selling sandwiches. And you just, like, I wrote about that stuff. And, uh, and I, I mean, I don't do, I don't do any, any as much kind of blogging as I used to. But I'm trying, like, right now I've made the commitment to just do something every day. Uh, yeah. You know, it's kind of seductive with Twitter. If you blog, it's easier to just post something on Twitter and get on with your day. And I've been doing that for several years, and Twitter's a great place to do some of that. But I sort of cheat on the longer, you know, longer coherent putting together of thoughts and sharing them. Also, a thing that happens on Twitter or whatever, you know, with subtweeting is uh, people put out part of what they think with the idea that you'll fill in the rest because naturally you've been keeping up with all the other things that have been said about this topic, but maybe you haven't, and I just think... Yeah, blogging gives you that longer form, doesn't it, to to sort of delve into a topic and you'll almost get your own thoughts together for, for how you think about something, putting it down on paper or, or a yeah. blog post, I think helps big time, well, yeah. Well, here's another thing. Suppose you're a young developer and you see other developers arguing about frameworks and they have really strong points of view and they have coherent arguments and you think what well, I don't know what I think you're not sure whether you should you keep using this framework is there a problem should you be using something different should you be writing your own code you don't really have a strong feeling about it you don't know writing is a good way to figure that out read yeah. and writing read and write and if you're a designer and you're presenting work to a client and they you know unless you want to tell them up here we've got a nav bar and down and there's the logo and you know if you, you want to tell them what they can already see that's great and here's the font I used and and here's an icon you know but if you don't want to do that if you want to talk to them persuasively about their business and why you've done what you've done how it advances the user goals how it advances the business goals and if you're able to listen to feedback and not respond with fear but like a colleague, writing again really helps you build up confidence in that by by developing your ideas and knowing what they are. So I I like that. I like meetups, talking even if it's just talking to your colleagues once a week about yeah, a project you're doing. Yeah, it's interesting that you touched on um, some of the business angles there, and and actually quite a lot of the questions that we've had through are are more um, more focused on that. So. Good, if it's good. all right with you, Jeffrey, I'll, I'll delve into some of the ones that we've got through. Um, and uh, we've got one from uh, Laurie Tompkins, um, which is a good one. Uh, and I, uh, the question is, have you ever been fired? And I, I'm assuming, Tori, that you mean by a client. Uh, and the flip side of that question is, how do you leave an angry client who does not see the value your services provided? 
And I think this is um, obviously you, 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 you started back out in studios album under your own name again. You kind of back in the fray pitching and things like that. So, yeah, have you ever been fired? And have you ever fired a client? Yeah, yes to both. Yes to both. So, I've been fired more than I've fired clients. I've only fired clients twice, and I've been working for like 30 years, so that's not too bad. Uh, yeah. But but uh, fired a lot. Oh, I was a terrible employee for one thing. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I would. Uh, I remember like I was working at an ad agency and. We were shooting a commercial, and we didn't have much money. The client didn't have much money, so basically, the agency president wanted everyone from the from the the little agency to go in and do all these jobs, basically do all these union jobs, non-union, you know, working our weekend. And at the time, uh, I didn't I didn't go well. I don't. I knew that I didn't like the idea because I thought it was exploitative. But I also knew that everyone else in the company was going to do it. So I don't know why I thought I was immune. I thought, well, I find that morally repugnant, so I won't do it. But I didn't tell him. I didn't say, here's my problem. Not that, I mean, he would have fired me anyway. But uh, I didn't really get company politics. Plus, uh, oh, I'd been fired because I had a drinking problem. I've been fired for being too smart. I've been fired for just not being happy. I... I I had a job, and after a few months, my boss said to me, "You obviously don't want to be here." And I really wanted the job. I didn't, I didn't like the job, but I needed a, I needed a steady job. So I said, "Oh, I," and I did everything that she asked. And she said, "You're, you're, you know, you come in late, and you leave early, and you smoke at your desk, and you're always dressed like a, you're on your way to a nightclub, and you know." So I started wearing a tie and a jacket, and I got there early, and I stayed late, and I didn't smoke in the office, and all this stuff, and at the end of several months, she fired me. And I said, "Okay, but, but why? I, I, I've done everything you asked." And she said, "Oh, I know, but I didn't believe you." I said, "I know you're still the same guy, because first impressions right. are huge." I've also seen, as an employer, I've seen where someone definitely deserves a promotion, but uh, so I, I'm sort of. But they're not going to get it. Not for me, the, because the decision maker still sees them as the junior they were when they came in. If you know what I mean. So, first impressions are big. Uh, obvious. Sometimes it's been a blessing. I've also quit. I quit a month before I was vested in a dot com company. They were like they had stocks for me. This was a long time ago, 1999. Uh, but I just. There were several reasons where I felt that it was a really bad fit for me and I wasn't comfortable at all. And I left and they said, you know, four more weeks and you'll own stock in this company. And I said, that's okay. And that was the right decision. I, uh, so I walked out on a client early. I, in fact, it was that job when I quit that I started uh, Happy Cog, my first studio oh, okay. in 1999. Basically, I looked around. As I was realizing I wasn't happy, I went, wow, like so much of my work is responsible for, in my opinion anyway, the stuff that I'm doing is the real stuff that everybody's jobs are based on, but I don't have decision-making power about it. I make the stuff. Other people are going out and selling it and talking about it. I'm not. I'm not in a position to defend it or talk about it. I make it. And then other people get a lot of the money, and I'm like, why do I need them? So I went out on my own, and as it happened, the industry was collapsing. Yeah. Uh, so, but it was actually a great time to start a studio because people still needed the work done. They just didn't, they weren't going to spend $100,000 on something that they could get for $30,000 or, well, when I said like $5,000, I, I, I pitifully underpriced for a long time, which is a whole other thing. Just from not knowing better, but but so firing clients, I got a uh, a consulting gig early on with Happy Cog for uh, a, a startup business at the of the time, and they had just hired an editor. It was it was a a community for women, and they just hired a woman who had been this fantastic editor of women's magazines, and she was really strong and 
knew everything about editorial, but she didn't know anything about the web. And it was really important for her to assert herself and sort of dominate everything that was going on. It was a new person brought in with like basically carte blanche, like, we know that we have a good business idea, but we know we won't succeed without you, so you run this. And she was running with it. And she brought me in to help her figure out what her web approach should be, but then she didn't believe anything I said, and it was just a bad fit. And I was getting, uh, I was getting paid a thousand dollars a day, which was more than I'd ever made in my life, and I was amazed by it. But I was unhappy, and it was like this only went on for four days, like, and, and when I say it was stuff like, I, I would, said show her something in sans serif and she'd say it should be serif and I'd go this was 1999 and I would say yeah but the way our displays are it's pixelated text and actually serifs are harder to reach to know they're easier to read I said yes in print they're often easier to read that's of course every print designer knows that but on the web now at 72 dots per inch with this pixelated type it's actually easier if you have a sans serif font with a wide, you know, uh, with a high X height. And uh, she said, no. And so she said, we'll prove it. And so I kept on, I kept on having to print out, like, here's some stuff Jacob Nielsen said. Here's some stuff about fonts. Here's some stuff Jeff Bean said. And I was like, if I'm the expert and she's paying me, but then as an expert, what I'm supposed to do is print what other experts say. Like, why am I doing this? So on the fourth day, I... Uh, stage managed it so that um, like a breakup. I stage managed it like a kind breakup. It's not you, it's me. I basically made it sound like she had a great vision. I totally believed in it, but I don't think I was the right consultant, which was true. I wasn't. And she may have had a good vision and maybe a different personality consultant could have said the same things to her that I was saying and succeeded. But for whatever reason, my sort of, the way I presented stuff to her wasn't working. So I quit and I had no other gigs lined up and I didn't have a bunch, any money in the bank and I had a girlfriend who wasn't working and yet I was sort of, it was snowing. It was winter and snowing. So I walked out in the snow like not knowing where my next gig was going to come from but going, I can't be bought. Yeah. Or at least I can't be bought for a thousand a day. So that was pretty cool. Um, then I've had two, fi two clients I fired as a studio. One, uh, it was that terrible, and, and both times I learned a lot from it. And basically, you just write better contracts and develop a better process, and then it doesn't happen to you anymore. Mm. One, uh, the client wanted, uh, it, was a, it was a game, and we did a design based on everything we discussed uh, everything we knew about the people they were trying to reach and everything we discussed with our client. And it was that situation where the client is supposed to be showing everything to this company owner and getting their buy-in, but you don't get to talk to the company owner. And then at some point, the company, uh, a very hands-on, uptight startup person who, you know, a founder, a kind of a classic founder of a small startup, that that guy came in and decided to start over, and he didn't know anything about the process. We we were uh, we were at the stage where we were building the templates on the design that was approved, and we were shipping templates, and he didn't like the design. But the time to have told us back, and this is waterfall days, right? The time to have talked to us about that was during the design approval phase. So it was the classic case of the the client doesn't look at it until it's too late. And then he basically squeezes out his, he doesn't say to his employee, I'm dissatisfied that you approved this in, in my absence. He just says, I'm not happy. So he sent a drawing. He had his, he, he sent us a drawing of like a, a, a table with like a glove and a, an ink pot and a feather pen. And I said, what's this to my client? My client said, it's a drawing. And I was like, I can see that, but. What is it? A, I don't know. What is it a drawing of? He said, "Well, this is what my boss would like," and he said it shamefacedly, right? I was like, "Remember, we're we're already 
we were already past design approval. We're already shipping templates, and the money is the money. It's not like they're going to find extra money to pay us for starting over. But it also didn't make any sense. And I said, okay. So I, I got to talk to the CEO finally, and I was like, uh, you know, we, um, we're pretty good at coming up with concepts based on research, and we're not so good at implementing other people's visual ideas. There are people who are much better than that. There are like photorealistic illustrators. I mean, if I knew you wanted that, I would have said no to this job. It turned you onto somebody who would be, you know, do a magnificent job for you. I'm not sure that making a photorealistic rendering of your design idea is the best use of our time, even if we didn't have this other problem. And the client said, well, that's what I want. I said, well, I've never had an unhappy client, and I've never stopped working with a client. I don't want you to be the first. So let's see what we can do to give you what you want. And that's what we did. And we brought it back to him. We basically rendered the, this idea that he had. And then he said, it's not liquid. Now, for the younger people in the audience, before responsive design, there was something called liquid design, which was kind of like a crummy, ugly cr precursor of responsive design. It, it, it came from the same set of suppositions. We can't really control the size of the viewing device or what size the user is going to set their fonts for. So let's make something that will work for anyone. That was the premise of liquid design back in the 90s. And uh, some projects were liquid and some projects were fixed width. And you'd sort of, it, it depended on. And, and I said, I don't understand. I said, this is a photorealistic image of a table with stuff on it. Why would that be liquid? Like it's a table, it's like a silly putty table that stretches and the glove gets, well, I don't understand what you, why you're asking about this. He said, well, isn't that the standard? I thought you're the standards guy. So at that point I said, okay, um, we can we can take this to completion, what we've given you, or we can stop working on this, and you won't pay us anything else, and we're done. And he said, well, I don't accept that. I want my money back. And I said, well, we have a contract that, you know, I'm sorry, but no. We've already over-delivered on this. I, I'm not going to do that. And then he, uh, he was in another country, and he tried to scare me by saying he was going to have someone surf papers on me. Uh, which did scare me because I was working out of my apartment. I was running a tiny shop with freelance help. I had no insurance, nothing. I mean, I really could have been, uh, I don't even think I'd incorporated as an LLC at that point. So it was really scary, the idea that I, you know, if this guy got the right judge or had a better lawyer than me or whatever, and I, nobody wants to, you never want to go to court with your client. You, you never want to go to court with anybody. You definitely don't want to be an agency that, that took a client to court. So I was just, I mean, sometimes people have to, but you don't want that. So nothing came of it, though, I, I must say. Uh, and there's one other story. Uh, I fired a client, and by then I had a much better contract. So I was building, because of the first experience, I was building in what the expectations were, and the contract actually had wording in it that says, at this phase, with this, with this, so, you know, with this piece of work done, uh, studio and client agree mutually to move on, and then their next payment is released. And if they can't reach agreement at this point, here's what the rights and responsibilities are. And it's all clear up front. And you have a lawyer look at it. You know, you either have a lawyer write it or you at least have a lawyer look at it to make sure you're doing, you know, you're, you're not doing anything that's ridiculous. And, uh, and all that, those things are pretty standard. Um, and I had a situation where a client, where we had an impossible client who was never going to approve and we realized that he was never going to finish, he was never going to approve the final delivery because he felt he had paid too much and he had decided that he was going to skip paying the last payment and that he was going to get us to do a bunch more work for free. And again, because I didn't want an unhappy client, I said, we'll do more, you know, let's and at a certain point, at, in our doing more, I said, okay, these next five things that you've asked for that are outside the scope of our agreement 
I will agree to them in writing, and those will be the last five things. If you will sign, we'll just write a simple contract that says, we're going to do these five additional things and not charge you for it. And then you, at the end of that, are going to pay us this amount of money. And he wouldn't sign it. And I said, so I'm saying I'll do all this extra free stuff, and you're, all you say is that you'll pay us the final third of what you owe us. And he wouldn't sign it. Then I said, okay, so um, if if we can't sign this by next Monday, then I'm going to assume that our contract is, is over and wish you the best of luck. And that's what happened. Um, and those are not, you don't feel good about those things. But No, no, I can imagine. Yeah, no, I'm sure a lot of people on um, who are listening in have, have had similar experiences of, uh, sure. of different clients. It's, um, we actually have another a client question, sort of flipping it on its head. Um, I'm not sure what it's like for you when you started pitching for work, whether you chose to specialize. But a lot of the people who are potentially listening today choose to um, specialize in e-commerce. But um, the first client, we often hear it, it's, it's the hardest one to get. How do you get your first client, in this case e-commerce, it could be in a particular vertical or niche, when you don't have a portfolio? So have you any tips to share on that one? It's interesting because I recently went through a not having a portfolio phase. When I left Happy Cog and started Studio.Zeldman, there were things I'd worked on at Happy Cog that I could show that were mine, but the write-ups, uh, it was complicated. So I basically had to launch without a portfolio. I still got some work, which is interesting, but I've also been doing this a while and I had some name recognition. Um, it is hard. I So I know that... Uh, Shopify has a network, and for a while we had Shopify folks in our studio, and I know that basically, and when I say Shopify folks, I mean partners, not exactly. Yeah, we run the first iteration of the studio with you. That's right. In yes, New York. and it's not like I. It felt like there was uh, basically a pipeline of jobs for people, so I think participating in a program like that, not to commercially plug the people who are hosting this thing, but I was actually impressed with that. I thought, that's fantastic. It made me yeah. kind of wish I, it made me wish I had that. It made me wish I was a Shopify partner because it would be nice to have a, a, a kind of a flood of stuff coming in. Um, I think we know, can let you join, Jeffrey. It's fine. We, we can make space. Okay. okay. Uh, well, we're, at, we're actually uh, doing a, we're doing a project now for, for a client I had 10 years ago. Uh, huh? We're just, uh, that that will we're basically adding Shopify to the site we designed ten years ago and making it responsive. So that's nice. It's like it's nice to hear from that. But okay, so getting your first client. Um, one thing I can say for sure is the thing we were talking about earlier really helps. Name recognition is huge. And again, I didn't start writing to get known or get work, but it really did, did work out that way. Um, I know that a man in Texas invited, you know, who had a huge startup business in the late 90s came to me because he'd seen something I'd written at Adobe.com. And the reason I'd been able to write that thing at Adobe.com was that I'd been writing at a list apart first. And I started a list apart because I was writing at Zeldman.com and felt comfortable and believed that, that I could write and that there would be an audience for it and believed that I could find other writers and there'd be an audience for it. So the more comfortable you get, talking about things, the more likely you are. And I see this all the time. I'll, you know, somebody on Twitter, somebody will say something interesting and I'll check out, you know, to find out a little something about them. And I'll see that they've got like 5,000 followers and I'll go to their site and they, excuse me, they have a particular niche. It might be um, their social media consultant or they do design. Maybe they do design for... Um, a certain kind of business or a certain kind of organization and they get followers who are people in that same industry who want to know and you know maybe those people go to a couple of big name studios they've heard of and they get this ridiculous high quotation that they can't afford and they go what do I do and and they look at you know they know WordPress is out there they know things are out there but they don't have the expertise to do that so what do they do um, and then they find somebody who's writing about it I know that uh, I hired Jason Santa Maria after discovering him through a blog post, not through his work. He wasn't—he uh, was already a brilliant designer, but he wasn't really well known yet. 
but he was writing. And uh, I had a reason for looking at and Google brought me to him, right? Not reputation, nothing else, just Google. And there not only was this beautifully designed site, but the guy was smart and had a lot of good things to say about design, even though he was very young and hadn't been working that long. Um, so I, I think, again, it certainly helps to get yeah. uh, uh, another thing you can do. Uh, how can I put this? So professionally, we're never supposed to charge too little, but you can do something in return for something. You can do work either maybe for a local charity organization or a local school or something, and then you, but you get to put your name in the footer and in the credits, and you get to blog about it. I mean, there's always ways to do that sort of thing. You add a store, you add Shopify or whatever to a friend's business's website, but you, when you redesign it, you get your name on it. I used to put my name, I mean, my company name in the footer for mm. years. I wasn't charging that much. I didn't know how to charge. I didn't know how to price. But I got an, uh, in source. In fact, if yeah. you've got good ideas in your in your source, there's nothing wrong with like putting your contact information and your ideas commented out explaining why you did what you did. Because I sure enough, that, somebody yeah. somebody's going to go, how did they, this carousel doesn't suck. Here's a carousel that doesn't suck. How do they make it? And they've used source and then see. Or uh, another thing you can do is um, put stuff on Code Pen, right? Or JS Fiddle, uh, because sometimes you get hired not by a business owner, but by somebody else in the same field that you know that shares uh, a passion for this work, but maybe has a different specialty than you. It's a, a you know so. You're I think designer. you're right. Jeffrey. Yeah, people in our network. Sorry, I was going to say people in the um, Shopify ecosystem often, um, you know, through the partner network or, or looking through the experts program, end up kind of having overflow work, and they end up, you know, becoming regular contractors for for agencies and things like that, which can give you that experience to then branch out on your own. And I guess with their with their blessing, you can use some of those examples in your portfolio, maybe. So I think or a place that you used to work. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, We've got loads of business questions here, Jeffrey, and I'm conscious okay. of the time. I really want to get through a few with you, if that's okay. all right. Um, I'm talking too was, long, but, sorry. No, no, not at all. Uh, that was for uh, Valeria. Hopefully that, uh, well, I'm sure it helped. Um, just a shout out for, to Joe Bloom, who said he remembers reading Web Standards when he was 16. I've no idea how old you are now, Joe, but I, uh, I remember reading that one too many years ago and the iterations as well. So um, one question, super quick. Um, you mentioned your contract template, and I know there are some good examples out there. Uh, Martin O'Gorman has asked whether you'd be willing to, sh to share yours. If you're not, what would you recommend people um, search for if they're looking for something particularly with a slant of web design or web services provision? I would be willing, but I I can't do it today. I'll need to look at the contract and write a post about that, but I think that's a great idea and I'll be happy to follow up on this interview by writing a post like that in a, a, a week or two. Um, yeah, I think that would be super helpful and appreciated. I, I, I think it's, um, I know there's people that we both know that have, have put Andy templates Clark out. Andy Clark did a really yeah. nice, uh, the contract updating killer. it. Yeah, the contract killer, which I is written in yeah. plain English. I've even, I've even used that, you know, and that's right. a great one too. It just basically says, you're you and we're we and here's what we're going to do and here's what we won't do and if I disappoint you, you have this recourse and if you disappoint me, I have this recourse and... Here's who owns the stuff and yes. all that. It's a great contract. I think if you just Google contract killer or yeah, Andy I think it's Clark, Clark with an E at the end. Where is it? Yeah, yeah I think you can or find that on GitHub. Okay, yeah, it's on GitHub or Malarkey. Just yeah, I think you can you can fork that as well. I think a lot of people have and, and sort of change that. That's, that's yeah, great advice. Yeah, um, you, make it, you make it personal for you because it's very much his personality. And yes. you may not be quite as jovial. You may not be quite as funny. I mean, he's a very witty man. So if you're if you're comfortable with the humor, great. And if not, you can tone that down and still have a great, yeah. Um, here's a kind of similar similar vein, talking about how to get experience. Uh, this is from Cody Grant. Um, do you agree with web development companies offering uh, only offering unpaid internships? No, I think work should always be paid for. Uh, and uh, 
it's not only web de <coughs> excuse me, it's not only web firms. When I was in advertising, that happened. Or you could, uh, I mean, I don't even really agree with low-paying jobs. It depends. I think mm -hmm. um, if you're going to really be giving them an education and spending more time teaching them, then perhaps I think some kind of uh, at least pay their subway fare. You know what I mean? At least there should be something. There should be some income for the person. Uh, obviously, you're not going to pay them the same as someone who's already accomplished. And it is, I don't know, I have really mixed feelings about it because I think it's a way that, um, I think it's a way that some companies could theoretically not pay their fair share. And here's what I mean. If you have a really great creative reputation, you could potentially hire people, call them on interns, not pay them, use their best work and build your reputation on that work. If you've got someone coming up with brilliant ideas for you and you're saying, listen, you won't get any credit for this now, but in two years you're going to be able to say you worked at our studio and we're the best. And I, that's sort of an ugly apprentice mm -hmm. system that I've seen in design and don't approve of, and I've seen it in advertising and I don't approve of. I think um, every job is educational. And it should be educational for the employer as well as the employee. Everyone you work with teaches you also by their enthusiasm or because they may be young, but they're paying attention to something new that you're not paying attention to, whatever. I think you're always teaching. We're all, all interacting and teaching each other. So I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think it's the greatest idea. At the same time, people do pay to go to school. So yeah. theoretically, you know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. It's like if it's, um, yeah. It's it, another I think you make it, you, I think, I would love to know the circumstances behind this question. And uh, I can qualify a little bit more for you. Yeah, Let please. me find, um, and this was in particular relation to um, students and recent graduates. Um, Cody asks, um, or do students, grads, not deserve comp compensation? Uh, because of the lack of experience. And I think you've answered that. Basically, oh, so everyone they deserves absolutely compensation. deserve compensation. And their, their uh, efforts can be very valuable. And sometimes uh, a young student who's real, who's keeping up with everything will write better code than uh, a tired hack who hasn't, you know, hasn't looked mm -hmm. at an article in five years. <coughs> like me. So, um, <laughs> well, I do look at the articles, but I'm, you know, I think uh, they absolutely deserve compensation now. now if there's, I can imagine a situation where someone's trapped in a dead end, there's not much work in their community, and they have an opportunity to relocate and work for a fantastic place that six months from now will either offer them a real job or will put them in a position where they can, uh, they can get the job they want, then they might consider it. Do you know what I mean? If, it depends on the circumstances. Sorry, my computer's my computer's telling me things. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, <laughs> I know the feeling. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, yeah, that that's a great response. Hope that helped, um, Cody. Um, maybe if you drop into the chat whether you've taken an internship, just for context, and, and whether you were paid, that would be quite interesting as well. Um, cool. Another couple of quick ones for you. Uh, oh, Joe is 26, so. Uh, yeah, you clearly helped him on his way with that book, uh, Jeffrey. Um, yes, we'll post a link to Andy Clark's uh, Contract Killer and any other ones that we can recommend. Uh, when we write up the webinar, my colleague Simon and I'll make sure that goes in. Uh, absolutely. Um, here's one to, to, uh, to mull over. This is from um, uh, Lillian Lee. Do you think design is being commoditized in 2016? How can we continue to push the boundaries and innovate on the web today? And, uh, you know, we've only got five minutes. <laughs> I'm sure we could talk about that one all day. I think uh, we can innovate if we start with the user and the product and build everything around that. If we make a custom site and a custom experience based on what the business is trying to achieve and what the user wants to do. And uh, on the other hand, if we think of it as, oh, yeah, this is template B. I'll just grab this off the shelf. This is, oh, I know how to do this. I'll use this framework. I'll use this. I'll copy this thing. 
if we and and some of this copying is a result is a response to the commoditization. It's a it's a self it's a self fulfilling uh, circle. So people are paying less and they're in more of a rush because they see it as a commodity. So you may not have the time. They may not have the budget that affords you the time to say. What is the product really about? Let me be creative. Let me take a few steps back. Let me innovate. And you end up going, all right, I'm going to grab Bootstrap and I'll grab this and I'll grab that and and we're done. And I'll use this color palette that I found over here because that's pretty nice and and I'm done. I you know and then because you did that and you did that for a certain price, the next client goes, well, my friend paid twenty thousand dollars and got this. So why why you know? So it's always a question of what your if you're in house, what your company will let you do and how strongly you can advocate, which is personality and persuasion. And it's the same with clients. Um, you can sometimes work yourself into a fortunate situation where clients come to you expecting innovation and willing to take the time and get it right. But that's very rare. And I have to tell you, um, you can be well known and still not. that's not most of your clients. That's not most of my clients. Right? I, I love my clients and I'm very grateful to them, but most of them are not like, take all the time you need, let's really innovate. Right? They're, they're, they, they know what business result they want and, it, and if, we can get them, if we can get them to agree to let us think about it a little and do a little research, that's already a victory. You know, and we're, we're known, so it's tough. It's very tough, but I think uh, that uh, innovation can also come when you work on a side project. So if, let's say you have five bread and butter accounts that you're working on and they all basically want something you could do with Bootstrap and five other tools in your sleep and you're not feeling particularly creatively challenged, so you make something. You make something cool and you share it with the community and in that way you innovate. I think uh, sites, uh, that in, sites that show innovation, um, Jen Simmons is starting Layout Land. You can sign up for it now. I think it's layout.land. Uh, but you Google Layout Land. It's, it's, for, um, get, it's specifically for breaking out of that box, breaking out of that slick look that we have and coming up with new, radically new layouts um, using tools like uh, the new CSS to do things we didn't think were possible previously. Um, so that's an exciting place. Uh, Code Pen is an exciting place where people innovate. Um, on your personal site, you know, everybody should have a personal site. That's a place where you can innovate, right? It's always fun to like look at somebody's really awesome personal site and then see the dull work they do at their job, and you go, okay, so they have bread and butter clients. Oh well, but is it more usable? There's always also satisfactions. Innovation is one important value, but there are other important values too, like was this easy for everyone to use? Were people able to use it? Were people who usually have a hard time able to use it? So could a senile person use it? Could someone with, uh, with uh, vision problems use it? Could uh, someone who's not very sophisticated about computers feel comfortable and safe? There's value to that too. I mean, usability is a huge part of design. And if you're making something that improves someone's life, that's something to be proud of. So it's not just cookie cutter. And I think the cookie cutter stuff fights that as much as it fights anything else. Just just by their very nature, most frameworks are not uh, progressively enhanced. Most frameworks fail if JavaScript fails. So there's always a way to rethink it. If you think about um, accessibility and think about extreme cases, Derek Featherstone has a great presentation on this. You know, when you design for extremes. Uh, it forces you to think about other kinds of users and other kinds of behaviors, and that forces you to innovate. Um, I think that can be a way to innovation, you know, and mm -hmm. and, it, and that's a, that's a way to defend. If you tell the client, "I want to put something in my portfolio," the client doesn't care. But if you say, "I want to make this available," you know, this is a site for the veterans, and some of them are disabled, and yet they can't use it. I'd like to fix that. My God, they're going to applaud you and say, yes, of course, we should do that. I'm ashamed that we didn't. Thank you for your help. So uh, I think if you keep it on, if you keep it focused on really providing a service to people, to human beings, that's a way to get to innovation, whether you have the luxury of time or not. No, that's really, really great advice. Um, Will you permit me one more question, Jeffrey? I know Absolutely. Really good, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's uh, let's find what else have we got here. Oh, so Cody, just for context, um, he's looking for um, uh, in London, Ontario. Most web dev companies only offer unpaid internships. Currently, a student without a portfolio, so I wasn't sure if it's justified for work for free. 
if I don't have a portfolio, but that answer really helped. Thank you. Um, and just I would say, try to do your own work. Try to do your own work. Noel Jackson, who I work with now, um, just basically designed people's websites and, uh, I mean, designed websites for himself and built a portfolio that way. When I was breaking into advertising many years ago, I put together a fake portfolio, right? Just, <laughs> I'd rather put together a fake portfolio than be an unpaid intern putting together a compromised portfolio for someone who then charged $100,000 for my work. Yes, so it's funny. Um, I, I've seen a lot of conference talks where people talk about the, the, not wanting to put the, the projects they've worked on in their portfolio for a whole variety of reasons, and so the ones that they they end up doing side projects or, or you know, particularly creative endeavors that they can then use to show their creativity in a sense. Um, talking of side projects, you you have quite a few, Jeffrey. You still have uh, your hand in all the uh, an event apart, a list apart, a book apart. Um, how, how do you find the time to, to run a studio and, uh, and three other flourishing businesses? Well, uh, I don't. So, for instance, a book apart, uh, Catella Du basically runs that day to day. She's, she's uh, our lead there. She's an employee and she's brilliant and she comes and grabs Jason Santa Maria, my co-founder partner, and me once a week and says, what do we do about such and such? An event apart, uh, Eric Meyer and I co-founded, and we have Marcy Eversole working 20 hours a day, seven days a week, figuring out how to make sure we can afford to keep doing it, and where's the next location, and 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 we have um, Toby Molina, uh, producer, uh, figuring out how to get the, you know the most so. Those two ladies do all, a lot of the work, and then uh, Toby and Eric and I figure out content in bursts during the year. So right now we're figuring out all of 2017, what's going to be important, and who do we talk to, and who should speak when, and there'll be this very intense burst of activity. As it happens, comes toward the end of the year when studios aren't as busy. Generally, okay. studios aren't as busy around Christmas, and then once the year starts, of course, there's still meetings, and in the middle of the year, we rethink and, and change the content up, but we have a break. You know, we're always, I would say, 40% of my time, I'm doing something for an apart business, some kind of <laughs> marketing or content thing. Um, I also, uh, Micah McFeeders is a brilliant managing editor for List Apart, who just looks at this flow of, we're getting so many more submissions now, we have so many more readers now, we're getting great stuff but it takes more people to look at it and we have these tremendous tech editors and these tremendous editors who, you know, and I will check in on Basecamp and go, that conversation makes sense, that sounds good. And I also know that these people are very much, I mean, we have brilliant people doing this stuff so that if I don't have time to look at it, I know we're not going to run some stupid article, I know we're not going to run an indefensible, uh, a technically indefensible or you know, or an anti-design or anti-user, it's all going to be good stuff. It's always good stuff. So basically you put together the right team and let them do their thing. And uh, the studio, I mean, today, uh, um, you know, Roland Dubois just uh, did some really beautiful uh, layouts for a client, well, style tiles for a client, and Noel Jackson is uh, putting together a guide for a client. And... Uh, I'm basically just checking in with them. So there's still stuff where my hands are on it. Like there's still things that I design and there's still things that I write. Um, not too many things that I code anymore because I just feel there are much better people than me who've come up. It's weird when you've written a book about this stuff, two books about this stuff, and then you feel like you're not good at it anymore. But I, I know, you know, I, Andy Budd wrote a book about CSS and I don't think he thinks of himself as a CSS expert today. And so on. And, uh, even uh, Eric Meyer is talking about, you know, usability and compassion and design now, and not, you know, not so much talking about CSS. So, you know, I think changing is uh, is part of what makes this career so interesting. Um, mm, absolutely. Did I answer the question? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll say yes. <laughs> did it you... Repeat the question. Repeat the question. What was it? Oh, I've scrolled down now. I'm trying to think which one it was. Was it the commoditization or innovation? I think we started that, didn't we? 
No, yeah, but there, there was another. There was a. This was a different question. Yes, it was. You asked how I do it all, and the answer is I don't. I work with good people. Oh, sorry. Yes, of I course. Could said, I could have said that much more simply. I work with really good people, lots of them, um, really smart, uh, dedicated people. That's one of the cats. But yes, your cat's been. Uh, oh, been has she been making little appearances? Yeah. Can you see Giovanni as well? He's the the black and white. You may not be able we to see. We saw the white one, I think. Right. So look, here she comes. She uh, um, she has a slow metabolism and a fast hypothalamus, like I do. Uh, means she's always <laughs> hungry and then it just stays on her. Like I know that feeling. Yeah, <laughs> I do too. Unfortunately. Uh, but, will Event Apart ever go to Canada? Someone's asked. I would love to. There, uh, I have Canadian cousins. My mom's family is from Montreal, uh, Ontario. Uh, I uh, Toronto. I, I remember also as a kid. Um, we have no immediate plans. No plans to do that next year is all that I can say. But I would love to do it. Um, however, there That's are also great really great. <laughs> there are great conferences in in Canada. It's not like you guys have nothing up there. You have some really great conferences up there. But, cool. Uh, I'm uh, probably going to push my luck for finding one more, but uh, okay. and then I promise that will be. It. Uh, let's see what else have we got. Um, let's have a look. Stop it, kid. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, oh, here's a quick one then. Um, obviously, over the last few years, you've sat in the front row of an event apart, and you've you've seen, I guess, a lot of trends come and go. There was um, obviously the rise of responsive, but then also this rise of mobile apps uh, as opposed to to responsive apps. Um, this is from Bushra. Uh, what uh, what's your advice for people planning to build mobile apps as opposed to responsive? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, it really depends. Um, well, first of all, do, do, do they mean native mobile apps or I will web take I will apps? take it as native mobile apps. Yeah, I'll take it as native mobile apps. Um, native. And please, okay. still, if, if you're still listening, please correct me, but I, that's what I'm assuming. Yeah. It really depends what you're trying to achieve, and and here's the thing: you need both. Apps don't just apps. All apps use web content. All apps use the internet to communicate. There's, you know, unless I don't know. There are some. I have an old app from Brian Eno that m makes choir voices, like loops of choir voices that can put me to sleep. That's pretty cool, and it doesn't need to go to the internet. I only needed the internet to download it from Apple once, right? I, sure. But but everything else. Think of the most. Think of the appiest app you can think of. There's Instagram, and Instagram's great, but it's grabbing content from the internet. And not only is it downloading content from the internet and uploading content to the internet, but you also interact on the web. So when you put out a picture and you like it, you can t you can tell you you can uh, tweet about it, and I can follow that tweet and go, oh, Kier just published a photo. In the old days when people thought apps were a separate thing and apps didn't need the web and there was this break between them and, and unfortunately many organizations still think that but it's not true Instagram initially thought that and so they had um, an app that basically just dead-ended so let's say Kier uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter and Kier says here's a picture of our beautiful vacation on Instagram and I go, oh, I like Kier, let's see that. And Twitter doesn't show the photo anyway, so I click the link and I go to the Instagram page, which says Instagram is an app. For, go, to the, go to iTunes or Android to download it. So I download it and put it on my phone and then go, now, show me Kier's picture. It doesn't show me Kier's picture. The, the app that I've just installed has no idea that I was on a, on a website moments ago, even if I was doing it on my phone. So I would do it again, and it would still just say, download our app and as a result Instagram was very limited in its utility I couldn't see your picture I couldn't follow you I couldn't see your other other pictures you'd done it was completely limited and then Instagram said okay we actually they listened to users who were complaining about this and they said well, let's figure this out and they're even better now than ever but even at the, just the very beginning they did things like now when I follow a tweet that says look at my photo, I can see it on a web browser, whether I'm at my desktop or on my phone, whatever, and whether I'm using mobile Twitter or Twitter the app, uh, I'm sorry, whether I'm using Twitter's mobile website or Twitter.com the desktop site or 
an app or a third-party app, whatever I'm using, I can get to your picture and I can see your other pictures and I can follow you and I can say, great photo, Kier. And like, as a result, Instagram was valued for a couple billion dollars and acquired by Facebook because once they had that web connection. And Facebook at the time had stopped calling itself a web company and was calling itself a mobile company. But notice they didn't buy Instagram until Instagram was connected to the web. Everything has to be. Mm. Nobody wants to download your app when they when they follow a link. So if, if someone's following a link to get some information from your website and you can provide a good experience on the web, then maybe they'll come back and maybe later they'll download your app. But if at the moment, in the very moment that they get there, you put up a screen that blocks them and says, you need to get the app, they're just going to go F you and move on. It's a, it's a very frustrating anti-user experience. So. Are there things that work better as apps? Right now, definitely there are native apps for photography and other things that I wouldn't necessarily want to try to do on the web, although that's changing and the web is getting more and more powerful. I still like the fact that the web can work for everyone on any device. I still like the idea of progressive enhancement. So a slick app that works just exactly like a web app I worry about that because there's the you know I worry about progressive web apps because there's the potential to just basically make something that requires JavaScript and a fast connection and call it the web, right? And uh, I was mm. just reading um, I don't know if it was on Tontic or uh, Jeremy Keith or somebody, but they were talking about uh, it was just some friend on Twitter that they they went they went somewhere and it said um, write to us at JavaScript required. And then a moment later, it said, write to us at, and there was a contact address. But they were using JavaScript to supply an email address, right? No reason for and And if it had failed, there would have been nothing. There was no default in place. And you can always work around that if you know what you're doing, but a lot of people don't. And a lot of people rely on these sort of prepackaged, bolted together frameworks. And frameworks are great when you know what you're doing, but not everybody does. So it's as if you, it's as if you built this, like, super powered view source and handed <laughs> it out to people who maybe don't have that much experience or have a lot of experience cobbling stuff together but don't know about accessibility and usability and things like that. So I would say it depends what you're making. There's definitely room for both, but neither precludes the other. If you have a website, you may need an app. If you have an app whether it's a web-based app or a native app, you probably still need the web. You almost certainly still need the web. And, and uh, I always think if you're siloing your content, and, uh, that's a danger. I like the idea of responsive because I like the idea that we're always giving, we're not assuming things about like the mobile use case like we used to. Like a few years back, we would say, well, you know, the mobile user is running to catch a bus and just wants to check up on her, on her stock prices while the desktop user wants to read a long article. This, we know that that's not true, that people use whatever they use at the moment that they're using and that, that most mobile use happens at home sitting sitting at the, on the couch, right? Mm -hmm. So there is no mobile use case. Um, but there's definitely a use case for some apps, no question about it. Again, uh, Spotify. Is Spotify not? Is Spotify what I'm talk, thinking about? The music app. Is Spotify? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Shopify, Spotify, sorry. Right, it's it's there's a web piece and there's an app piece, and which you use depends on where you are and what you're doing. So I think you're I think you all almost always need the web, no matter what else you have and no matter what your prime your core business could be uh, an app, but you would still need the web, if that makes sense. Absolutely, um, I could talk to you all day, Jeffrey. I'm sure um, many people could listen to you, but I know you've. Uh, You've got commitments, and uh, we have reached. Uh, we've run a little over, but so thank you for thank you for staying with us. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I'm, we've had some really uh, really lovely comments in the in the questions here, uh, cool. which I'll share with you as well. Some lovely feedback um, and some uh, some thanks for all that you've done for the industry over the last uh, 15, 20 years. So I'll uh, absolutely get those across to you in the next day or so. Um, really, all that I can say um, again is thank you to yourself. Thank you for everyone who's joined us and spent the last uh, hour or so with us. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed it. I hope you've got a lot of value um, from it as well. Uh, 
for those people out uh, out there who are listening and for those of you who've asked questions, thank you. Um, what will happen next is we'll um, we'll edit the video, we'll let you all have a link to that, and uh, we will also um, take some of this learning, put it into a blog post, uh, add in the links that you've asked for, and uh, share that back as well. And um, obviously send you a link to that, uh, Jeffrey, uh, yourself as well. So. Um, Yes, um, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you again, Jeffrey. Uh, I hope we can do so this much. again sometime, and I hope our paths cross uh, IRL, as they say, in real life very, very soon. Thanks. Thanks again. Bye bye. Take care. Cheers.